worship the Lord this evening. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's sing it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. From the heavens, praise His name. Praise the Lord.
we can be worn out for Jesus, amen? And that's what we're doing. We're just wearing ourselves out. It has been so good to be here. I, I know, you guys have to see just for a minute. That's okay. We're going to breathe for a second. Uh, I know that uh, uh, some of you guys know who we are, but United Voice Worship has just been on a journey. And through this journey, we are truly about bridging life together. That's the beauty of this family. This family's had its own struggles. We walk, walk life together. But it's beautiful when you can work through each other because of love and love through Jesus Christ. So we're going to share uh, this next song. It's a very beautiful, powerful song. It's called the title Clean, and it's on our volume two. Precious blood has left me forgiven, pure like the whites of snow, powerful to make sin and shame retreat, this covenant is making me whole, so I
God, we are so grateful we have this opportunity to offer up our hallelujahs. We have so much in this life, so much in this world to be thankful for. We've been blessed with beautiful sunrises all week. We've been blessed with the sound of the ocean, this constant as your love, God. We've been blessed to be in the company of brothers and sisters who are dearly loved, and we give thanks, God. What a family reunion. It's not just in nature and not just through your word, but through the people right in front of us that we're reminded you have a forever kind of love. So thank you for the assembling of these hearts and minds. For each person gathered in this room, God, I pray that you will bless them. Because if you bless us, God, we have been blessed indeed. Most of all, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. The one who is risen from the grave, the one who rolled the stone away, the one who is sitting at the right hand, the one who will come back again for us. We say Maranatha as we look forward to that day. But help us to be so earthly good while we still remain, Lord. Help us to be the type of people who demonstrate what a forever kind of love looks like in every interaction. Forgive us when we fail. But we thank you again for a new opportunity to shout hallelujah and to live out a life. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray that you Amen. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your God. Oh, no. 
So glad that you're here. It's a privilege to be able to welcome you tonight. My name is Tim Parent, and in my role at Pepperdine, I have the privilege of uh, working with Mike Cope and Rick Gibson in church relations. So thankful for their work and leadership. It gives me a unique perspective to see all the planning and preparation that goes in to this week. It is really an act of love for the church, love for our ministers and leaders in our churches and our members to prepare this feast of a week. So can you join me in showing appreciation to Rick and Mike for their great leadership of this effort? They would be the first to say that it's a, it's a cast of thousands that make this possible. And so we give thanks for all those who are part of bringing together this week for our nourishment, for our enjoyment. I've been to Harbor something like approaching 30 years. Uh, and uh, I recognize that for some of you, that's like Pikerville. That's like you all are, are thinking 30 years. That's just, uh, you, you just came yesterday. For others of you, this may be your first year at Harvard. And uh, you can't imagine 30 years. And you're thinking now, how old is he? Uh, that, that's okay, too. But for me, this, uh, we heard in our prayer this morning, for me, this is a great family reunion. This week, it feels like just a little taste of heaven, doesn't it? that uh, you, it, for, for Lucy and me, it connects so many different parts of our life and the reunions and the reconnections and the spiritual food and the nourishment we get here, the chance to worship together, the fellowship time, it is a rich experience. And I hope for you, it's been a time of equipping and empowering, of encouragement, that this has been a week that's really brought you uh, in a renewed spirit and a great place where you can go back to your own churches and serve and love. We are here to celebrate God loves forever and that is something worthy of celebration my friends well uh, i have the privilege not of introducing someone who's uh, not new to the pepperdine family but he's taken on a new role uh, this year i was privileged to lead uh, a search for the next leader of our hub for spiritual life at pepperdine the hub for spiritual life is uh, leads the way with regards to student spiritual life and development it's a really important function at pepperdine and this year we uh, named a new person into the role of Associate Vice President for Spiritual Life at Pepperdine. He's here with us, and I want you to meet him. Tim Spivey. Uh, Tim, stand up, please. Uh, welcome, Tim. Tim's not new to many of you. He's been in ministry for a long time. He just has finished 12 years as the founding and lead pastor at New Vintage Church in Escondido, California. He's been a senior minister for Churches of Christ in California in Texas, the great state of Texas. And uh, we're so thankful to have Tim in this role. And he's with Emily tonight. We're so thankful for Emily Spivey as well. Welcome, Emily, and thank you so much for taking on this role. We're excited about the future of spiritual life at Pepperdine. We have such a great group of folks who lead in that area. And I hope that you are encouraged by the investment and the commitment that Pepperdine 
is making to its spiritual life on our campus. Well, tonight we are blessed to hear from Richard Beck. He's an author and professor of psychology at Abilene Christian University. His latest book is Hunting Magic Eels, Recovering an Enchanted Faith in a Skeptical Age. And I have really enjoyed getting to read Richard's book. I highly recommend it. Here's just one statement from the book that really captured my attention. He says this, let's stop going through the day living as if God doesn't exist. God is everywhere present. God isn't that mysterious neighbor living in the apartment above you. God is closer than you can imagine. The signs and sacraments are all around you. You are living in the house of God. Richard also serves as an elder at the Highland Church of Christ in Abilene, Texas. And on Monday evenings, he leads a Bible study for 50 inmates at the maximum security French Robertson unit. Richard speaking tonight on Reconciled in Love. And before Richard speaks, we'll be led in prayer by Bruce Bates, who is a minister at the Feast Church. This has been a feast this week, and Bruce just decided to name his church Feast. The Feast Church in Providence, Rhode Island. I love that. He's also the director of coaching for Kairos Church Planning. So please welcome back United Voice Worship as we continue in worship. Let's praise him Praise the O God, O the Son of thy love, O Jesus who died and is now born above.
song from the scriptures. I think you guys all know this. The song is an invitation to worship. And I really love this one. Because I saw the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me.
because you gave it all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Spirit, for receiving us, for planning all of existence for us and all of those who don't know you yet. Holy God, may we be your people. We thank you that we can even come into your presence. How delightful to be with you. Lord, we know there's a cloud of witnesses cheering us on tonight. If we want to see those we have loved and lost, we come to church and we worship. For we are with them there. We thank you, Jesus, that we are with them. And all of your amazing heavenly host that goes beyond description. That we do not have words for. Lord, we thank you for our tribe, our fellowship, Church of Christ. Oh, my goodness, Lord. You know our words. They are so many. But, Lord, how many of us can say our best friends in the world are in this tribe? How many of our spouses are from this tribe? How many of us met you in this tribe? Lord, we are so thankful you have used it. You have given us a field, a place to work. May we work your field well. Yes. Father, I ask a prayer for your son Richard tonight. Yes. Oh, Lord, he's prepared so yes. well and hard. You've been preparing him since the day he was born. May he feel so ready and so accomplished and right to present the word you have. Father, we are your people, but we have more work to do. You're not done with us. We have another run, and we have another run to make for those who come behind us. As we sit and stand in a place, a place of wells we did not dig, may we be about your work for others. May we be people in churches on mission, building new churches, building new places, having coffee, having our neighbors over, demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. May we be your ambassadors. Give us the gift of speaking a word of reconciliation between us and you. We thank you, God. We're listening. Bring us your word tonight. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.
chapter 5, verse 18. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And so therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making, God making his appeal through us, and so we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. From Revelation 12. Now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. And yet he was defeated, and there was no longer a place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying this, Now is the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ have come forth. The accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down. The one who accuses them day and night before God. Because they have conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who gave birth to the male child. The dragon became furious with the woman, and he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So I, I grew up in the uh, 80s. I was a child of the 80s. And the best thing about growing up in the Church of Christ in the 80s is that we still celebrated Halloween. <laughs> Anybody celebrate Halloween growing up? And we actually had in the basement of our church a haunted house. This was a thing. We had a haunted house in a church. And what happened was the, the youth group and the adults would go back and forth in like an escalating competition of horror that was unhealthy, um, trying to see who could outdo each other. And I, remember the, I remember vividly the day we lost the competition, because I remember being ushered into the haunted house in the basement of the Erie Church of Christ, and laid out on the table was our preacher's wife in a lace dress, with a big, like, guillotine swinging through her midsection, screaming with blood, and all you can do is just like, well done, adults, well done, I mean, like, like, you can't top that, you know? This was spiritual formation in the 80s. That's what we go off to school and get a degree in that. Um, you know, but then what happened? The satanic panic. No more Halloween. All right, no more haunted houses. Um, but not to be outdone, you know, because Christians were an innovative group, right? We don't want to leave the haunted house to the occultists or the Satanists. So what we do is we kind of, okay, we're going to give the, 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 the haunted house a, a Christian spin. And thus was born the Judgment House. <laughs> How many of you guys ever seen the Judgment House? There's one that shows up in Halloween on my block every year. How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? This is a very peculiar, this is a, as a psychologist, I'm, I'm a curator of curious Christian behavior. And this is one of them. So what you do in the judgment house is first you got to bust in a bunch of lost teenagers because this is an evangelistic effort. And then you bring them into a room and there you see like a, like a teenage party. Kids are drinking beer and they're smoking joints. Kids are making out on a couch. And they're about to go off to a bedroom. You just behold this, the wickedness and the depravity. And we all watch it. What's going to happen? 
we all go to the, we all go to the next room. And the next room is like flashing police lights and an ambulance and, and broken glass and the bodies of bloody teens sprawled out upon a highway. They've, they've all come from the party and they've all died. They've all just died in a traumatic car accident. I'm sure like middle schoolers are trying to figure out like, what, what have they brought me to? I showed up, they put me on a van. <laughs> and here I am in the basement. And then it gets worse, because you know where we're going next, okay? This is, exactly, right? This is Dante's Inferno. We walk to the next room, and there we are. It's all dark and scary and spooky, and the demons are tormenting all of the children that have just died in the car accident. And you just behold it, and you look across the room, and you go, hey, isn't that Jim, the college intern, dressed up like Beelzebub? <laughs> Long summer, that guy. <laughs> and then after we just behold, right, what's awaiting these sinful teenagers, we're then ushered up into the auditorium, which is heaven. And there, the sales pitch is made. This is what awaits you. And yet, because of God's reconciling love, Christ has paid the debt for you and that doesn't have to be your fate tonight if you accept Jesus Christ tonight as your Lord and Savior. These are Baptists, so they're probably not getting baptized, but still, you can accept <laughs> your Lord and Savior and get baptized here. And I figure this is the worst conversion story ever. They're like late in life. Like, when did you come to Jesus? It was Halloween night. <laughs> it was Halloween night. And they took me to a basement. And I decided right then and there to give my life to Jesus. <laughs> now, now, what's interesting about this is that we have our own, we have our own versions of this. Um, I have my own story with this. My very first sermon, I was in junior high at the Erie Church of Christ, and I was given the opportunity to give my very first like, real sermon, which is on Sunday night. Remember that? We'd go to church on Sunday night. So I was given that opportunity to preach the sermon on Sunday night, very first sermon I was ever going to preach in my life. I had to put some thoughts together. A week or two before, I had pulled a, a track. Remember church track? I pulled, a, I pulled a church track out. And the title of the track, it was written by Jimmy Allen. You know what's coming next. It was written by Jimmy Allen, who I did not know. And the title of the track was, you know this track? What is hell like? And apparently this is a very famous sermon that was toured around in our church. What, was, what is hell like? And it was a, just a, a grim litany of the judgment house. And as a little junior high person, I thought, well, people need to be warned. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is awful. And so that was my very first sermon. <laughs> so these, these, these lukewarm, slacker Christians that came back on the second night, I'm like, they need to hear this. Apparently, so I did it. I was stood up there and I started just working through the proof text about, and then something happened. About halfway through that sermon, I, I began to weep. I began to uncontrollably weep. I'm sure my parents were like, our poor child. Uh, <laughs> like you'd be led with this sermon. And I, I sobbed all the way through the rest of that sermon. And I think something in me that night um, broke. And I realized and sensed, although I couldn't articulate it then, that this, this didn't seem right. Something was, something about this way of speaking about the love of God seemed broken and dysfunctional. It couldn't be, it couldn't be good news. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think might be wrong and how we have to be careful when we talk about the reconciling love of Jesus. And I have three concerns tonight before I get to a vision of, of how I think we can proclaim this news. My, my first concern is just a practical evangelistic concern. I, I remember a couple years ago I was in Europe. And Europe was, we know, much more secular, much more post-Christian. And I was visiting with some Church of Christ missionaries in that culture. And they were struggling 
They were struggling with a kind of a judgment house presentation of the gospel. Right, because kids, you can't get to the good news until you tell people about the bad news. But kind of showing up in somebody's doorstep and said, let me tell you. And, and what they were doing is using what some have described as revivalistic evangelism. And revivalistic evangelism was, was evangelism that worked back when everybody shared basic Christian commitments. It was a general Christian worldview that sat behind that. Because if people shared basic Christian convictions... You could begin a conversation about the love of God by asking a very simple question. It comes right out of the basement of the Judgment House Church, which is the question. If you were to die tonight, do you know where you would spend eternity? And when people share Christian convictions, that's a great way to kind of bring people right up to a moment of choice and decision and moral accountability. But in a post-Christian culture, in a post-Christian culture, asking that question sounds like we just transported you out of the, the Middle Ages and plopped you <laughs> in a world that you just, it doesn't, it doesn't compute anymore. And, and some of us are struggling about this in our churches. After COVID, our churches have shrunk. And I know my church is asking, what does evangelism look like? We've lost some skill sets here. We, we kind of could, could assume if we build it, they will come. And so we were talking about evangelism. What are we going to do? And then somebody said in the table of our leadership, uh, hey, before we start making plans and initiatives, maybe we need to have a conversation about what the gospel is. And I quipped, well, if we don't know what the gospel is, we're in trouble. <laughs> but I do think underneath that question, what is the gospel is, is a question about maybe the way we have talked about the gospel. There was something off in it that we need, to, we need to get that right because we don't want to repeat some of the mistakes of the past. Which brings me to my second concern. Like, what mistakes are you talking about? Well, one way we have described how God reconciles us is, well, that judgment house story. That we begin with a very gloomy, stormy picture. The wrath of God. And that stormy, angry God directs his face at us in judgment. But in the death of Christ, that stormy countenance becomes sunny and happy. But it doesn't end there. It's not, not how I grew up, because that Sunny countenance could also be what? It could be lost. And he could become angry again. What we've done and we've described the love of God is we've introduced this, this sense that God's affections to us were changeable. Right? God's affections towards us were variable, volatile, unpredictable, inconstant. And what that creates in us is a religion that becomes a faith that is primarily about monitoring and managing the emotions of God. And what that breeds in us, speaking as a psychologist, is what psychologists would call an anxious attachment. An anxious attachment is when a child constantly has to monitor and manage the unpredictable emotions of a parent. And if we're not careful in how we talk about the reconciling love of God, if we unwittingly or even intentionally convey to our children the sense that God's emotions are variable and fluctuating, and we instill in them and form in them a lot of anxiety, our whole denomination has, I would suggest, and this is hard to say, formed a lot of anxiously attached Christians. Every time we bowed our heads and said, may our worship be pleasing, in the hope that it, that it would be, we hope that it, it would be received well. And it was scary to us if things went wrong. I remember one time, one of my buddies was leading communion. 
And he got confused, and he sent around the, the juice first. <laughs> Anybody ever had this happen? And I looked at my friend, I'm like, we are going to hell. Like, like, <laughs> like we are. Like, there's no, I mean, he, like, this is not pleasing, okay? This is the next up. We are not, we are at jeopardy here, okay? I remember, I remember some, I remember, uh, uh, one lady at our church had gone off for the summer. I, I think she worshipped with a bunch of Pentecostals. And she came back. And I remember she, she began to clap in our church. Anybody have a clapper at one point? Like an intrusive clapper? And, and, you know, there wasn't anything about clapping in Scripture. But it was just, we were all a little uncertain about, about the clap. You know, like... And so we, I mean, I, I kid you not, we sat her down. So here's the thing. We as a group are unsure about what he feels about this. And since we were all very anxiously attached, just cut it out. Like, just cut it out. Don't, 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 don't put us at risk, right? Because you had... You know, so, oh dear, you know, um, but seriously, and we all, you all can tell your stories of that, right? Can you tell stories? Um, that's signs of a lot of anxiety. Uh, so this came up recently in my church. You know, we had gone through a discernment, like we all go through discernments. You know, back in the day we were discerning, I remember my... My grandma went to an anti church, you know, so they were discerning, you know, kitchens and stuff like that. You know. I, don't, I don't know why God would be upset about that, but they were concerned about that, that he would be upset. And so, wanting to manage that, those emotions, they, they, they didn't have a kitchen. You know, in, in our churches have tried to discern instrumental music, and churches are discerning gender stuff, uh, women's roles, and and what I said to my church is we were going through our discernment, because as I'm sure as your church has gone through those discernments, you, you start seeing the anxiety rise again. I, um, is it is going to be okay with this? Are we sure? Is it risky? What if we get it wrong? So I said to my church, I said, you know, I think we only ever really have discerned one issue in our fellowship. I mean, I know the topics change, but the, but the issue that really only ever discern over and over and over again is, is God for you? Is he for you? Because that's, that's really what we're trying to discern. It's the issue is one thing. How to read scripture, like there's lots of, we, you know, we struggle with that, but the anxiety under it is that anxiety about getting it right. That that's what we're discerning. Is he, how fragile is this relationship. Because I, I think we've raised our people to kind of basically say that God says, here's the game, everybody. Here's the book. Okay? It's not all that clear. Richard Beck will also confuse you one night at Pepperdine. <laughs> right? He's going to throw sand in your eyes. And, and your job, is, here's the game. You've got to get it right. You show up at the pearly gates and you get that discernment wrong that you made in 85 or 2000, right? The whole thing's in jeopardy. There's a lot of anxiety behind that project. Is God, if you get it wrong, if we make a mistake, is he for you? Is he for you? So here's the other sad thing about that. Is that, is that because we have formed a lot of this anxiety in our people, um, there are some people that have some hard feelings about being raised in our tradition. There's a lot of anger, there's a lot of hurt, and we know some of those people. And they, and they, and they point a finger back at us and they say, um, you, you scared me. You made me afraid of God. And those fears, they go deep. Deeply instilled anxieties Tendencies toward gay, uh, guilt and shame, those are not easily shaken off. Right. 
No amount of medication or therapy can break you loose of some of those scripts. So I think we got to get this right. Because there's a lot, there's a lot at stake, pastorally speaking. Like me, we can break the hearts of our, of our children. But a lot of us, you know, as we heard that very beautiful prayer, a lot of us just love this tradition. And I remember I was online talking to people about why I just love the churches of Christ. Um, why I didn't, like, internalize the damage that other people incurred. Like, what protected me? You've got to ask this, like, why didn't some of these messages about an angry God, like, not stick with me? And somebody said to me online, like, I bet you had good parents. Like, I bet you had good parents. And I want to be clear. Like, I don't think good parenting is a silver bullet. But I think in my case, it, it might have been true. And somehow I filtered the messages of a, of a fragile relationship with God through the affection of my, of my parents, especially my mom. My mom just beat into us this sense of her unconditional love. I probably shouldn't. I should, she didn't really beat us, I mean, but there's more of a verbal beating. She just instilled in us. Now, my mom was a very short but fierce person. She hated when my brother and I got too tall. She hated looking up at us. And so and every time we had a serious talk with mom, she'd just kind of grab you by the scruff of the neck and pull you to eye level. So I spent most of my life talking to my mom just like this. Just look at my mom eye to eye, this fierce woman's eyes burning in my soul, you know? And the message she'd say over and over, and this is like the, this is the way Paula Beck raised me, okay? My mom's still alive, okay? She's probably watching this, but she would say to me, like, listen to me. You could, you could kill somebody. She always went, mom swung for the fences, man. <laughs> You always go. You could kill somebody, and I would still love you. Okay? And you know how, like, your mom's got you all tied up. She's trying to get away, you know, trying to run away from her. She's like, come here. Pull you back down. You could kill somebody. You know, I would still love you. So I take two things away from that. One... My mom sent me very ambiguous messages about homicide. <laughs> like, I I'm just saying she wasn't exactly clear <laughs> on that point. Like, and, and probably to this day, I still kind of entertaining, entertaining homicidal thoughts more than I should. And I, I blame her. Like, she put it in my head. I could kill somebody. My mom would still love me. That's, that's like a, that's a blank check right there, I think. <laughs> oh, my mom. Mom, is too much. You ever look at your mom like, too much, mom? Um, <laughs> but the, the message she really instilled with me is just this fierce, uncondition I mean, unconditional love. Like, she just, like, if I took one message away from that relationship, it was like, this love is not fragile. Right. It's, it is, there is nothing you can do. And, and she said some crazy stuff to communicate that, but that was what she was trying to communicate. It is, and I think about that, I think about those conversations with, with my mother, and I think of Isaiah 49. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Moms? Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she's born? This is, this is God asking the question. And then God goes further. He goes, but even these might forget. Right? Mother, mothers fail too. Even these may forget, but God says to his people, and I will not forget you. Right. That, that God basically, in Isaiah 49, basically takes the fiercest love on the planet, a mother's love, 
and says, okay, start there. That's your multiplier. Then you multiply that to, to borrow from Buzz Lightyear, <laughs> to infinity and beyond. How fragile is that relationship? How volatile, changeable is that love? And so I do think there was something about when Paula Beck instilled that in me that kind of maybe from a, an attachment perspective kind of filtered the messages that I got on Sunday morning through an affectional <laughs> lens that maybe at some deep level I never really believed in that angry God in the sky. That maybe... He wasn't going to send us to hell for clapping. <laughs> Maybe that God was for us. Which brings me to the gospel tonight. My biggest concern about sometimes the way we describe the, the love of God is that it's just not the God that is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. The way I would say it is this. I think Revelation 13 gets at it most closely. Jesus is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Did you hear that? The lamb who was slain before time itself. So let me say it clearly. When we think about the reconciling love of God, when we look at the crucifixion, when we look at the cross, what we are seeing on the cross is not a change in God's affections for us. We're not seeing God work through some sort of sacrificial machinery to where he get his head right to love us. We're not seeing a change in God's affections towards us. What we see on the cross is what God has always felt about you. The lamb who is slain from the foundation of the world. What comes into view in human history is how God has always loved you and will always love you and will never change or will ever change loving you. Now, at this point, I'm sure you might have some skeptical thoughts. There, you know, there's, but what about all those judgment house texts? What, what about the language of separation and, and how, like, those are there. So let me just suggest, did you hear what was going on in 2 Corinthians 5 when I read it? The story described there is not God reconciling himself to us. Did you all hear the asymmetry in it? It wasn't about God reconciling himself to us, but what? Us being reconciled to God. Let me suggest that when we think of those, that language of separation and wrath, that we're using language that are describing self-inflicted separations. The issue is on our side. The issue has never been on God's side. Right. Al uh, Alistair McGrath, he has, a, he has a quote that I think captures what I'm trying to say pretty cleanly. He says, the doctrine of reconciliation presupposes that something has gone wrong. That the relationship between God and humanity has been broken. And that human beings stand in need of being reconciled to God. But reconciliation is not about changing God's attitude toward us. But about changing our attitude toward God. And that seems... Like a magic trick, like a verbal magic trick I pulled out of a hat, or a bit of abstract theology, let me just make it plain. Let's just think about the father of the prodigal son. When you look at the father of the prodigal son, at what point did the father have to kind of like get his head right about the son? At what point did he, did his love go from stormy to sunny? The, the son loves the father before he leaves. The father loves the son as he's leaving. The father loves the son as he ventures out into a far country. And the father loves the son 
when he comes back. The, the love of that father never changes. It remains constant. So I would suggest that as we think about separation and reunion and we think about far countries, that that is our side of the conversation. And that the father's love is not changing and variable. It is as constant as a mother's love for her child to infinity and beyond. And that we do not introduce into our conversations about the love of God any sort of contingency, any sort of variability, any sort of fragility there. And so the, the best thing I could suggest as we read the text, those judgment house texts, the best hermeneutic I can give you is your own love for your children. That is the best guide I have for you on how to read scripture. That's all right. Come on. Let your love for your child guide how you think about that. And I know it's hard. I'm not suggesting up here that in 30 minutes I can solve all of the difficult texts, but my suggestion is to put your love for your children. And if you don't have children, put the love of the prodigal father out in front of you and follow that as far as it goes. And if that is true, then let me suggest tonight here at the end that our gospel may need some extra schism. I didn't read Revelation 12 to freak you out, okay? I read it because it's a text that has haunted me for a long time. Did you hear the vision there? That the devil, the, the, the Satan, uh, and, 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 which means accuser, the one who accuses us before the throne of God, day and night. It's, it's almost a legal term, like a prosecuting attorney. And that idea that somehow there was this prosecuting attorney in, in the courtroom of heaven accusing me day and night was, is terrifying. I mean, the way I imagine it is like when I die, I'm going to go up to hell, not hell, I'm going to go up to heaven, sorry. I got that judgment house in my head. I'm going to go up to heaven. And I'm going to walk up to the pearly gates, and I kind of imagine the devil there in like a, a corporate suit and a briefcase, and he's going to see me coming down the road. He's going to look at his watch, and he says, Richard Beck, right on time. And we're going to shuffle into the courtroom of heaven, and I will stand over him in the defense table, and he's going to walk over to the prosecuting attorney table, and he's going to click, click his briefcase. I always hear the click, click. <laughs> he's going to pull out a file on me, like all of this stuff, and he's going to make his case. And he's going to look at the courtroom of heaven lick his finger, go to page one, and say, shall we begin when you were three? I'm like, three? <laughs> like, he's going to start at the beginning. Like, when you were three, you hit your sister. And then there's going to be this litany of shame and grief and every secret drug out in the open. And I imagine this case is going to go on and on and on. And then hours later, he'll turn the page, drop the file on the desk, point a finger at me in accusation and say, this one doesn't deserve to get in. And he's right. But the gospel is, the gospel is, did you hear Revelation? When you walk up to heaven, in the, in the courtroom, you're going to look over at the prosecuting attorney table, and there's no one there. That's right. Right? That's right. That voice has been kicked out, thrown out, and all you're going to get, all you're going to get is not a, a wagging finger of accusation, but you're going to feel an arm come up on your shoulder as Jesus stands beside you and looks to his father and says, Dad... This one's my friend, right? You're going to get a defense and not accusation. 
But why did I say our gospel needs an exorcism? Because that voice of accusation has been thrown out of heaven, and yet it pursues us on earth. We accuse each other. There is no voice of accusation in the parable of the prodigal son from the father. But there is an accuser in that story. Who's that? And I think what is sad sometimes is how we, instead of being ambassadors of God's love, have become the accusers of the world. We accuse the world with our judgment houses. We have accused the word with our, what is hell like pamphlets. We accuse the world every time we take the social media and wag our fingers at the world. And so church, can I make this appeal? Can we please stop doing the devil's work? So what does that look like? What does it look like to be an ambassador of reconciliation? To exercise the gospel of that accusing voice? As was mentioned, I'm a prison chaplain. This is my last story. I'm a prison chaplain, and one day I was just talking about the love of God, you know? This unconditional, fierce love of God. And I'm just waxing eloquent, I'm just sharing the gospel, and I remember vividly in the front row, inmate named Steve raised his hand and he said fortunately Steve did not have Paula Beck as a mom and Steve said you know how can I believe what you're saying because I have never heard a human being in my life say they love me I've never heard my dad say he loved me I've never heard my mother say she loved me. I've never had a friend, a lover. I've never had anybody say they ever loved me. So how can I believe that love when I have not heard a single voice on this earth say, I love you? And so he found the love of God to be, frankly, unbelievable. And so every week when I go back out to that study, I make it a point to do what? to stand in front of Steve and say, Steve, Steve, I love you. And I tell him not to be a good person. I'm an ambassador, not a Richard Beck's love. Because that is a a frail and a volatile thing. But I stand there as an ambassador of God's love. I stand in front of Steve to make the love of God believable. So this is my encouragement for you. Be an ambassador of God's love. Wherever you stand in this world, wherever you are physically located, may you make the love of God believable. May your church in your city and your neighborhood make the love of God, believable. Do that. I think people will understand the fierceness of a father and a mother's love.
Would you thank Richard Beck, please? <laughs> Richard, I, I had this thought while you were preaching that I, I've been the preacher for both Jimmy Allen and you. <laughs> and, and so I was remembering the, my, my dear love for Jimmy and his great love for me and others. So on, and you, you affirm that, and I, and I thought of what you've meant to my life. Tonight, this topic just matters to the core to me, so I turned to a friend, and I can tell you, as Richard's preacher, for a lot of people, he's celebrity, blogger, psychologist, theologian, author, all of that. I just knew him as a preacher where he and Janet were the last ones setting up chairs after a church meal and driving the handicapped van and going to the prison to preach and so on. So these are authentic words from one who's lived in scripture and cares deeply about people coming to Jesus and knowing the love of God. So I appreciate you, dear friend, and that strong word tonight. A couple words before we go out today. First of all, for anxious parents here, we did forget to leave off the words uh, Making waves is happening tomorrow morning. So that is happening during the morning session. Just check your app. It's been refreshed there. But some of you were worried that maybe there was no child care in the morning. There, there is. And uh, so please make note of that. Last night, Rick had that wonderful presentation in memory of Joella. It was just my honor to work side by side with Joella for a decade. Couldn't imagine doing this without her and as her illness turned more severe and we kind of suddenly had her say, I can't continue. Lectureship seemed like the furthest thing away. Harbor would happen one way or another. It was just our grief. But then eventually I did get back to, I don't think I can do this without Joella. You know her competence and her love for you. God provided. There was... Another amazing co-worker already in the office. She stepped in at the 11th hour. She and I together have tried to remember passwords and other things. But Tammy Williamson has made it work this year because she loves the church. Because she loves Pepperdine. Because she's invested in this. And I don't know when the last time she really had a full night of sleep was. But Harbor happened this year largely because of the love and hard work of Tammy Williamson. Tammy, would you stand, please? <laughs> and, and to say the obvious, that one of the best friends of your life, you were grieving her loss, even in the midst of stepping into her chair and continuing this. So we, we give you thanks tonight. You and Jack have been wonderful servants of the kingdom for so long, and, and it means so much to us. Well, dear friends, there is, as you might guess, a lot happening tonight. There is dessert and coffee in the Waves Cafe. We have three receptions. We have a couple classes. And then there is another worship time led by Chris Goldman and the Northwest Church Worship Band that will be in Smothers Theater that you are invited to. You are the beloved of God. The Father has known you from the foundation of the world. What a wonderful image about Christ being chosen for you, for us, for the world, before the foundation of the world. And so if, if nothing else tonight, I hope you go away examining that anxiety that sits back there. To know that you are beloved. And to be able to just breathe that in, that I am loved by God. And then go out free to share that love with others. That's a lovely picture, and I, I thank Richard for helping us with that. Let's close with one final song. Would you stand, please? I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures for generations. Now to do the same thing for